Dmitry Orlov returns to the Geopolitics and Empire podcast for the third time. He's a well-known Russian-American writer, blogger, author. His works include The Five Stages of Collapse, Shrinking the Technosphere, and many others you can find at cluborlov.blogspot.com. We'll be discussing the ensuing global economic collapse, which he warned about many years ago. We'll also get his thoughts on the geopolitical situation, all in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Let me just remind listeners to subscribe to all our channels on social media, share, like, leave us a podcast rating and review, and please do bookmark and subscribe our new channels on BitChute and Brighteon because YouTube is censoring everyone and anyone who questions the narrative uh, these days. You can also leave us a donation on a Bitcoin, PayPal, Patreon, or our new Subscribestar. I also urge listeners to subscribe to our email list that includes our weekly interview and collection of news headlines. So now on to Dimitri. How are you doing these days? Good. Thank you. Doing well. Now, some of the themes I wanted to have a look at include your take on uh, COVID-19, the economic collapse, uh, and your thoughts on the geopolitical front between the U.S. empire, China, Russia, the EU, uh, and some thoughts on what listeners might want to be doing to protect themselves as this collapse advances and anything else that's on your radar. So to start with the so-called pandemic situation, you know, I'm of course a proponent of science, which literally means knowledge, but sometimes I'm getting uh, annoyed with this kind of religion of scientism today, uh, which is being passed off as science or the search for truth. I'm happily willing to recalibrate my beliefs with new evidence regarding the coronavirus or other such issues. Considering the guests we've had on previously, including the author of the Bioweapons Act, Right now, I'm tending to lean toward COVID-19 being lab-made. We've got scientific articles coming out saying that there are insertions. And then we had a half a dozen bioterror simulations immediately preceding the pandemic in 2019. But from listening to your recent interviews, uh, you you refrain kind of from making a judgment and rather make the observation that China and Russia have responded as if the virus was was an act of bioterrorism. Uh, what are your thoughts on COVID-19 and the pandemic situation in general, uh, as well as its origin? Well, I think it's a it's a wonderful virus that just happened to turn up just at the right time. It turned up about a little under six months after the, the entire U.S. financial scheme for the first time showed definite signs of actually collapsing. And that's when U.S. treasuries could no longer be used for overnight loans so-called repo, repurchase loans. These are supposed to be the the safest, most liquid investments in the world, the deepest financial market in the world. And suddenly the instruments that underlie it have turned out to be worthless. This was a long time in the making, and this is now running its course. The financial system in the U.S. is really now in, in complete total agony, and it won't be long now. But this virus turned up at just the right time You see, the world has negotiated a very large number of contracts in the U.S. dollar, trade contracts. The only way to really get rid of this entire flood of contracts and renegotiate them is to declare a force majeure, such as a a virus pandemic. China and then other countries have uh, blown this virus completely out of proportion. There are about 20 coronaviruses in circulation. Some of them cause people to cough and sneeze. Others just pass unnoticed. Some of them cause them to run a fever. This one is interesting in that uh, a lot of people don't get infected at all. A lot of people get infected but don't know it. Some number of people get infected and cough and sneeze for a few days and maybe run a little bit of a fever. Diabetic, obese patients with high blood pressure, most of whom are over 80 years old for them, it, it kind of just kills them. So it, it really, if, if you try to invent a virus that would make a country younger, healthier, and more competitive internationally, this would be it. If, if somebody thought that the way, to, the way to attack an enemy using a virus that basically got rid of an overburden of, of old, sickly people, this would be it. So that, that's my piece of evidence that as a bioterror attack, this is just downright stupid. But overall, it gave politicians a great deal of cover in general so that they didn't have to take responsibility for the, for the commercial collapse that had been building for most of the previous year. If you look at the industrial output of a country like Germany or, or a country like Japan, those are the big two, 
they have been declining continuously. It's hard to say what's what's going on in the United States. It, it supposedly has a large economy. Well, not anymore. Now it's down by a third. But it, it was supposed to have had a large economy. But uh, most of that was, was just like, um, you know, Americans overcharging each other for services. So it didn't really add up too much. And so there isn't much to say about U.S. industrial production. There just wasn't much of it. But overall, it gave politicians a great deal of political cover for the time being. Of course, that's not going to last forever. And it's interesting you mentioned this force uh, majeure. The first politician that I've noticed actually used this term was here in Kazakhstan. President Tokayev, I think just a week or two ago, I was reading in the English uh, language Kazakh news, actually used that term uh, force uh, majeure for what's happening here in Kazakhstan. So maybe we'll start hearing other states use this term uh, as well. I wanted to get your thought uh, on the response by the governments that have been, some call it, you know, authoritarian, dystopian, totalitarian. Those There are nuance, nuances there. But analysts such as Peter Hitchens in Britain, he's mentioned, uh, it's kind of strange how in Britain, churches, for example, which have been shut down uh, around the world, have in Britain not been shut down for 800 years. So going through the the worst crises we've had, uh, as well as in the U.S., for example, churches have never been shut down during the Civil War, World Wars, Revolutionary War. How do you view the authoritarian or, in some cases, totalitarian response uh, by states? Well, in a lot of cases, this signals that, uh, you know, the the rot has finally gotten to, to the roots of, of the social system in those countries. You see, every society has a, a set of internal rules in terms of what goes and what doesn't. If you break one of those rules, you, what you get is a riot. You know, the, the torches and the pitchforks come out. But then if you get a, a population to a point where they are sufficiently feckless and dispirited and brainwashed so that they, they don't really have any sense of agency at all, they just... Uh, uh, try to fit in as best they can. They do as they're told. They're very scared that, you know, some administrative measure will will take away their internet or whatever else they're addicted to. They'll just do do as they're told. And the fact that churches have been shut down, well, you know, churches have been shutting down all over Europe. Some of them have been turned into discos, you know, nightclubs over time. Some of them have become mosques and some of them have been just boarded up or knocked down. There isn't very much uh, faith in God left in, in Europe. And that was one of the underpinnings of uh, European culture. Once, once, uh, once Europe becomes completely atheist, there isn't really much for it to fall back on. And something you mentioned earlier was how this pandemic came just in time and how it you know, coincides with the economic collapse. And I think we can look to history and the historical cycle where we often see plague, war, uh, and economic collapse, as well as uh, totalitarianism intersect. You know, the easiest example was the end of World War I, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, and the rise of the Nazi party. Uh, you already mentioned uh, this economic collapse, and you gave snippets from around the world. Uh, as, you, as you said, like uh, s- some analysts have mentioned that it, it began really summer t- 2019, uh, the fall 2019. Uh, we're starting to see, well, in the Great Depression, the, we've had, we had 25 to 35 percent unemployment that took three years to manifest from 1929 to 1932. And apparently in the U.S., uh, we've reached this level in three months. So According to some folks like John Williams at Shadow Stats uh, and others, we've got upwards of 30 million unemployed in the U.S. today. How do you see things uh, unfolding from here on out? I know it's it's May 2020, and people are starting uh, are, are saying that we're really going to start to see these things unfold in in September, in, in this fall, as well as uh, spring next year. How do you see kind of things playing out? Well, in the very first article I uh, I published. On, on the subject of uh, the collapse of the United States, which was, uh, I believe, in 2006, I wrote that the United States is poised to undergo something very similar to a disappearing act. It will simply dry up and blow away. And um, I still stand by that, that assessment. What we're seeing now is um, the tax base has become irrelevant in the United States, that is, uh, you know, how much taxes the government collects is is such a tiny amount 
relative to how much it spends, that it could just stop collecting taxes and probably save money doing that because it costs money to to operate such a gigantic and unwieldy tax system, which doesn't manage manages to completely fail to tax corporations anyway. Corporate taxes have just completely disappeared. So that's that part of the equation is gone. The U.S. taxpayer is no longer a thing to refer to. The other thing is that uh, we've all heard about government debt in the United States being uh, outlandishly high and uh, a lot of it being owned by foreigners. Well, the foreigners have sold off much of their U.S. government debt already. And uh, now all of the new quote-unquote debt that's being produced is instantly being bought up by the Federal Reserve, which prints money in order to do that. Um, Not only that, but now the Federal Reserve prints money in order to buy up or, or ameliorate dollar shortages from people trying to sell every other kind of commercial instrument in the United States. All kinds of bonds and stocks are being turned into uh, freshly printed cash, uh, which is unsupported by any industrial or economic activity because the services sector is largely shut down. Uh, There isn't much production going on. Energy production in the U.S. is plummeting. And there really isn't an economy to support this this amount of uh, new money. You know, trillions of dollars a month are being coined. And so far, they haven't really sloshed into the consumer economy because there isn't much of a consumer economy operating at the moment. But the moment they try to start it up, it'll turn out that there's too much money for the amount of of product that has been produced that is available. At the same time, uh, trade relationships with uh, major U.S. exporting countries such as China are being wrecked. The Chinese are becoming adverse to trading with the U.S. and and Americans are kind of being brainwashed into not buying Chinese products. So if you look at what was available in in the U.S. before the coronavirus, it was all Chinese-made stuff. And if that disappears, then you have lots and lots of dollars and, and, uh, you know, nothing to, to buy with those dollars. And and the, the way I, I want people to, to sort of uh, internalize this problem is, you know, it used to be that you came with your, uh, your bucket of U.S. dollars and, and got whatever you wanted. And it's not like you'll, you'll come with your bucket of dollars and not exactly get what you wanted or get less. It's more like you'll get punched in the face. It's more like people just won't accept your money at all. And uh, I don't know how long that'll take, but my feeling is it could take as little as the rest of this year. It's, it's really, it's going fast. It, it, this printing press agony, you know, it, it can't last forever. It, it can't go on for years. Once, once a system gets into this mode where we'll print all the money we can because that's all we know how to do anymore, it's almost over. I'm guessing that's one of the reasons you left uh, the U.S. for Russia some years ago. Uh, I did the the same as well many, many years ago. Uh, so effectively, would you say the U.S. now in 2020 is sort of entering its 1990s Soviet-Russian collapse moment? And do you see some kind of later on some type of civil war or even what we're seeing now in Ukraine, this uh, secessionist type movements, uh, as we've seen like Donbass, the fighting and, and Crimea, uh, do you think we'll start to see at least more push or t- towards this sort of thing? Well, I, I don't think uh, <clears throat> I don't think the political system in the U.S. is going to hold together particularly well. It already is failing at, at all kinds of different levels. And uh, I think that the, the problems are just going to get worse. We have, there's an, a pre- presidential election coming up, and uh, it turns out that we have one, one president who probably won't get reelected because the economy is, is just, has been destroyed. And, um, and nobody really wants to vote for presidents who have uh, stood by and watched the economy get destroyed and, you know, acted indecisively. And then his opponent is uh, has severe brain damage. Plus, he he is a criminal, and and now the evidence that he's a criminal is is out there on the internet for all to see. It's it's basically you know he confessed to being a criminal, and now all the rest of the evidence is there. So it, it's not just him talking. 
and and so there isn't much hope for for the executive of 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 the federal government now the only reason that the states kind of hold together is because of this incredible federal government largesse the federal government has been a conduit for confiscating people's savings from around the world through the dominance of the US dollar and handing that money out to people in the United States allowing them to live far beyond their means and this has gone on for decades now as the dollar system fails that wealth pump also fails and once the federal government cannot deliver that largesse to the states what on earth will compel those states to do what the federal government wants wants them to do they'll just go their separate ways they'll start making their own treaties with other countries and with each other and and just completely overstep you know the the prostrate body of the federal government something uh, interesting that i read the other day from this uh, western journalist uh, who's based in russia but actually does a i think a fair job covering Russia. His name is Brian McDonald. He pointed out how Russia's purchases of U.S. bonds in just the last two years, uh, they've gotten rid uh, from 96 billion down to something like two or five billion, less than 10 billion. So just in two years. So what, what you're saying, yes, we're starting, we're starting to see foreigners get rid of U.S. debt and, and treasuries and, and bonds. Uh, and just your uh, last thought on the U.S. dollar, there's this huge debate where People uh, are saying the dollar is going to get strong and, and say strong. It's not moving for, for many years. And then others who are saying, you know, the, the dollar as a world reserve is dead. I'm starting to tend toward that. I, I think we could see it lose its power quite quickly, especially with uh, China and their digital yuan, which I think because it's digital electronic, it can quickly uh, become adapted and gain a greater status uh, coupled with what you're saying people just uh, overstepping use of the dollar so i mean just your thoughts on the dollar as the world reserve well people only need the dollar to the extent that they're involved in trade that uses the dollar and have obligations that involve the dollar so for instance russia has a non-zero amount of u.s treasuries in its possession because that is the the easiest uh, way to settle its dollar debt, which is not huge, and it's generally getting whittled down because it's a liability. So once countries have shifted to using the U.S. dollar in, in, in their international trade and have gone to uh, bilateral relationships, negotiated using local currency swaps backed by gold and, and various types of guarantees, and barter relationships, which Russia is particularly good at, then they don't really depend on the dollar system. So the Americans can pretend that their dollars are, are incredibly valuable, except that they can't export anything, and nobody particularly wants to trade with them. So uh, at that point, it sort of becomes beside the point how valuable the dollar is, or whether or whether it even exists. Before moving on to the some geopolitical uh, thoughts, I, I thought I'd look at a little bit of controversy uh, surrounding you that, that was a bit kind of fun that popped into my uh, social media feed. So I subscribe to a lot of newsletters, forums, sources of, it, of information in general. Uh, you know, I take everything in and in my feed will sometimes appear uh, Ugo Bardi's uh, Facebook group called the Seneca Effect. And I think there's a lot we can learn from everyone, including whether it's yourself or, or folks like Ugo Bardi, but uh, a thread appeared in my feed discussing you, Dmitry Orlov, where they were kind of saying how you've flipped the script or gone crazy, referring to your position on the theory of man-made global warming, uh, which has been rechristened as the theory of climate change. I find it amusing that instead of polite discussion, folks always resort to ad hominem attacks. I'm all for the preservation of the environment and getting after polluting corporations. Uh, I personally never saw the science and data to substantiate the theory of man-made global warming. Uh, but what's your take on the ecological as aspect of the collapse, um, the climate change movement? And I don't know if you uh, were aware of, of that comment uh, about you. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the folks who aren't happy with your position? Well, you know, it's sort of like, um, what would be a comparison? When, when dogs are not brought up right, they're abused or, or they, they, they just, uh, uh, they don't have a, a, an owner of the breeds that require, you know, an alpha male to be part of the pack. They just kind of go off, you know, their, their personalities get warped in a particular way. 
and then there's nothing to be done about them except to put them down, as sad as that sounds. And that sort of goes for a lot of uh, uh, people in the West who have bought into this uh, liberal dogma, whether it be uh, concerning gender relations or whether it's uh, concerning environmentalism. They just cannot be disabused of the, of the notions that have been inserted into their, their heads uh, by people who are basically into population control and don't want humans to breed. A lot of the people in power in the West right now are in the camp of people who just really don't want humans to breed anymore. Uh, they want to replace them with robots or whatever, but they're just like not, not into having to deal with more generations of, uh, of uh, children. So there's really nothing to be done about them. There, there's no convincing them. And I'm not surprised that, you know, they have bad things to say about me because I have even worse things to say about them. So we're even. As far as, um, as, far as global warming, I was actually kind of uh, going along with the story until I started doing a bit of my own research, uh, mostly based on Russian sources, because the Russians, they, 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 the Russian scientists, they don't have any specific allegiance to these Western institutions that have been pushing these ideas. And so I discovered, for instance, that the, the ocean warming is, is not being caused by atmospheric warming at all, because it's happening throughout all of the layers of the ocean. And deep ocean probes have proven that. So the ocean is warming from below, not from above. What does that tell you? It tells you that the nuclear reactor that's at the center of, of, uh, of the planet has kicked up a notch. It's pr producing a bit more heat at the moment, and it's causing the oceans to heat up and swell. And that, uh, that, that's causing ocean level rise. So that's one discovery I made. And the other discovery I made is that if you look at the, the solar output, it's actually lower. So it doesn't really explain uh, global warming at all. We're approaching a solar minimum. Uh, and and the planet should be getting colder by all rights. If you consider the greenhouse effect, which is driven by solar radiation. Another thing I discovered is that all of these predictions on uh, ocean level rise flooding, flooding various continents and, and continental shelves, well, the rate at which it, it's happening uh, will be such that seismic activity will compensate for ocean level rise and, and uh, most of the continents will stay exactly where they are. The coastlines will stay pretty much exactly where they are. So that's just a false argument. So what we've been exposed to is a barrage of misinformation, all of, the, all of it politically motivated, all of it to convince us that we should start behaving differently, as opposed to dealing with real problems having to do with uh, various types of pollution and environmental destruction, which we are not really told very much about unfortunately. And so we don't do very much about them. Yeah, I would agree with you. I, I taught some years ago, I was given a course called Environment and International Relations. I examined both sides and I, I just couldn't see uh, the data. And I think we're, as you say, we're entering a phase of cooling because, you know, the, the, the solar minimum. And I think we can see that. We recently had a cold spell all around the world uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and I agree with you. It's it's got more of a, it's uh, based in ideology and, and politics, not uh, science. So, but it's it's not just ide ideology and politics. It's also a bunch of swindles. Uh, so, for instance, uh, because global warming is supposed to be uh, caused by carbon dioxide, uh, people invented these carbon credits and made them tradable. So now there's this uh, uh, fake financial market, uh, and also they've plowed lots and lots of taxpayer funds into wind generators and solar panels, which first of all, don't work. And secondly, they, they, kill, they kill power grids. Uh, if, if the number of this ragged renewable energy that goes up and down, regardless of what the demand for electricity is, if it reaches more than a certain percentage of, of the total power output of it goes into the power grid, it destroys the power grid because uh, the mechanisms needed for to compensate for the raggedness of it and and uh, keep the uh, keep the power grid up become outlandishly expensive to a point where electricity is too expensive to maintain an industrial base that will then in turn maintain the electric grid and the whole thing starts falling apart. Uh, Germany has uh, kind of 
gone almost all the way to that precipice and walking back. Western Australia is more or less at that point. The UK has gone in that direction pretty far. But basically, anytime anyone tried to run this experiment, it's been a failure. Luckily, I don't think now that you know there's there's uh, there's so much uh, uh, economic upheaval, I don't think anybody is going to be building any more wind generators or solar panels. I think that's going to be kind of just like abandoned as a failed experiment now. I, I would agree with you. And uh, moving on to the geopolitical front, just wanted to get your thoughts on the U.S. empire, who's continued to poke at Venezuela, Iran, Syria, North Korea, perhaps not so much lately, uh, but they have been pressing on Taiwan, South China Sea, and the South Pacific front. I, I recall interviewing not too long ago the former Chatham House director, Victor Bulmer Thomas, who believes the U.S. empire is in retreat. Uh, other experts I've interviewed believe the U.S. Uh, will retain its stature. Uh, what are your thoughts on military conflict and the U.S. empire? Well, I think that this coronavirus pandemic and the response to it are sort of uh, a way of not fighting World War III. Basically, it's, you know, it's, it's just kind of like a, a way of various countries, China uh, foremost amongst them, of standing up and, and shouting boo as loudly as possible and then watching who dies from a heart attack. And then if your enemy dies from a heart attack, then you don't have to fight a war with them, obviously. And, and so uh, the United States and Western Europe are now basically down with a heart attack, and there will be no World War III. If, if, you, if you think that under current conditions, NATO will somehow rally and organize against a military threat, not that there won't be a military th threat, there may be one and maybe uh, tiny, and yet it will uh, deal the U.S. and, and NATO uh, an absolutely humiliating military defeat from which it will be unable to recover. So that, that may be the plan for World War III, you know, not a bang, but a whimper. You know, it's like uh, throw a war and, and see who shows up, and if nobody shows up, well, it's over. So we've looked at the U.S., uh, and then let's go over to where you are uh, in Russia. Uh, how do you see Russia today? And then also, what are your thoughts on the constitutional changes that were, or, or the vote for constitu constitutional changes that were supposed to happen in April in Russia, but have been postponed, uh, whether P Putin will remain as president beyond 2024? Well, uh, taking them in reverse order, uh, what will happen after Putin is more Putin, because he's built a, a very successful political system. And it he has built it around himself and, and his personality. A lot of that has to do not with the mechanics of power in Russia, but with um, the, the egregore of the Russian leader, if you will. Uh, Russia is a country that has to have a political center focused on uh, an individual. That has been a historical pattern for the past thousand years, and I don't think the next thousand years will bring any changes. So that, that's not a surprise at all. Uh, throughout Russian history, a singularly competent and capable leader has, has risen to the occasion and, and has done absolutely outstanding feats that nobody would have predicted. This is not something that commonly happens elsewhere. It's a, it's a Russian trade. But the, the system that he's been, built, he's been building is rather successful, and he's been very much focused on 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 recruitment and training. So he has an entire conveyor belt of new Russian leaders who are now ministers and governors and, and moving into other positions who he, whose training he, he's been overseeing and, and he's been nurturing and mentoring them. And, and so we can be pretty sure that when the time comes for Putin to be replaced with somebody else, it will be a Putin lookalike that that person will be different from Putin in, in, in that he will have a different name. And that's about it. So those people who think that they can somehow reform Russia from the outside by getting people to vote for some alternative candidate who will basically do their bidding as opposed to the bidding of the Russian people, that seems really unlikely because, uh, you know, what the Russian people have experienced since, uh, since the year 2000 has pretty much convinced them that that what they have now works much better than what what came before. Uh, there are still some people, kind of the 1990s mold people, 
who 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 are still active in in Russian politics to some extent. But the reason they're active in Russian politics is because of Western grants. No other reason. They're getting bits of money, and once that money dries up, which it probably will eventually, then they will basically go back into the woodwork and will never be heard from again. I'm pretty sure that that will happen. As far as the uh, changes to the to the constitution, a lot of that is is pretty much overdue. The idea of Russia being a social state that produces that that provides guarantees to its people as opposed to this western rights-based rhetoric, actual social guarantees of of uh, being able to have decent living conditions, that appeals to a lot of people in Russia. Uh, the idea of, of Russia being Russia populated by Russians speaking Russian is also something that uh, people look forward to seeing it enshrined in the constitution. It's not really nationalism, it's just recognition, uh, because un- until now, Russians have been a people without a country, because uh, the Russian Federation doesn't specifically name Russians, even though they're the vast majority of the population, as being you know, the proud owners of, of this huge territory. And now that's going to be remedied to some extent. And there are other changes that, that are similarly useful, such as uh, within the Russian territory, putting Russian law, giving, giving it primacy over any foreign re- legislation. That's, that's an important step too, because that was eroded during the 90s under Yeltsin. So they, these are all changes that uh, they're, I think they're going to be popular, and I think their time has come. There's the Swiss historian uh, Daniele Ganser, who, when he was asked in an interview, you know, he, he's an expert in history and geopolitics, and he he says, you know, there's about 200 countries, 194 countries, and we cannot be experts on every single country. So, you know, the reason that I always ask uh, you when, when when we have you on and other guests, I, I, he says so we want to look at the five great powers, the the big players. So that's basically, you know, we already talked about U.S. EU. Russia uh, and China, more or less, and perhaps a few others. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you finally about China. Xi Jinping has recently given a conference, I think, and unveiled a new plan called the New Era, which seems kind of to recalibrate the Belt and Road. And it talks about double innovation, uh, internet digitalization, deep sea ports, industrial zones, increased nuclear arsenal and the clean coal. Some say China's economy is on the verge of collapse. I'm not so sure. Others say China is a great menace. Uh, again, I'm not so sure about that, but I do fear the exportation of their authoritarianism, which we're beginning, I think, to see in the West, this kind of Chinification. Uh, we're seeing that with the internet censorship and other issues. Uh, and then we have this new Iraq weapons of mass destruction style narrative being built for war with China. So how do you, what are your thoughts on China, this push for war, and whether it's just trying to sell arms uh, using the new Cold War as a pretext, uh, or if they really want to go all out on China, which I think earlier you said you don't see them going for World War III. Well, I, I see it as a kind of a, a, a battle not barely worth watching, because on the one side you have the U.S., which is basically uh, uh, crawling to battle with a sucking chest wound, and on the other side you have China, which is really working hard to you know, to fight its urge to just basically curl up and go to sleep. Because um, China doesn't need the U.S. It doesn't need to be afraid of the U.S. It just needs to stop trading with it. It needs to somehow isolate its economy and its trade routes and relationships away from the U.S., from the contagion. And the historical urge that China has always had when things are good, as they are now, is to self-isolate. And I hope that this doesn't happen again because the outcome for China uh, is usually tragic in the end. Isolation really doesn't work. I don't think that's going to happen this time because now Russia and China are working in tandem and and China does have a lot of uh, uh, strong relationships with uh, other countries around the world. So I think it'll it'll be able to to get through it. But I think what Xi Jinping has been saying recently is basically, um, you know, because, you know, he's saying things because he has to say something, not because it means a whole lot. Everybody knows that we're just going to muddle through this period. There's no chance that Russia will just suddenly collapse like the U.S. is collapsing, because China actually has an economy, like a real economy of of, uh, things that 
that it can produce that people will want to buy, that people need. If you look at uh, all of the maintenance materials that the world uses, all of the spare parts for all sorts of industrial installations that, that have to keep running, uh, simple ones like, you know, pumps, water pumps, how many of those are made in China? You know, how, how many um, transformers, electrical transformers are made in China? Can the U.S. maintain its power grid without transformers that are made in China? That's, that's a very simple question to ask. I think the answer is no. So I think in terms of this conflict, it's sort of, uh, we, we will say, from the, from the U.S. perspective, we will say bad things about you because this will help our president to get reelected. And we all know that after he's reelected, if he's reelected, we'll stop saying bad things about you because we need your, your electrical transformers. We'll need your water pumps because otherwise we won't have water to drink. You know, it's that sort of thing. What are some things people can do to better weather? G general things, because uh, people will have to figure out the details for themselves based on where they are and everything. But what are some general uh, things people can do to better weather the next phase of the storm? Because we're already smack uh, inside it. You've prepared for this, I think, long ago. But, you know, one of the biggest ideas in my mind is just generally getting out of a big city having a small plot of land where you can be self-sufficient and also finding like-minded people, kind of having a, a network. Folks like uh, Charles Hugh Smith writes about this on his blog. Other collapse analysts have been uh, contrarian where they've said it might actually be better to remain in a, in a city or, 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 or a town. Uh, what are some general themes uh, that you would suggest for people to mitigate uh, you know, the, the economic collapse and civil unrest? Well, I, I think the, the most important type of uh, uh, preparation is psychological. You know, I, I think people who uh, are hoping for, for a happy end uh, will definitely be disappointed. There won't be a happy end to this. As far as just basically muddling through and surviving as best you can and, and sustaining the least damage, the most important thing is to have options to uh, not foreclose on, on any given thing. It may be that rural living is the thing for you, then again, it may turn out that this, this is a dream, especially for people who haven't, haven't even tried it. There's a, basically a 10-year ramp-up period to embracing rural living in any given place. And if you move to a different place, you start over. And kind of the, the same thing in the city. It takes about 10 years to, to, to get situated, to get enough uh, uh, acquaintance, acquaintances locally so that when things fall apart, you still have... Uh, friends to call on and, and uh, resources to, to, to make use of. And, uh, you know, in, in general, people, people are better off staying put if they don't know any place other than where they've been living for a long time. Because in a risky situation, uh, the worst thing you can do is increase your own risks. You know, that, that makes obvious sense. So whenever you move, there are risks that you'll get into trouble because you because of just ignorance of the local situation. If things are fine, you know, if everything's going swimmingly and you're welcome wherever you go as long as you have some spending money, then you'll you'll make it through. But if things are disrupted and and unsafe, the security situation isn't particularly good, and you arrive in a place that you where you don't have any local connections and aren't aren't familiar with how things work, then you'll end up in a lot of trouble almost instantly because risks have this way of multiplying. You don't want to multiply too many risks together at the same time. Apart from what we've covered, uh, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Uh, you know, something that's been uh, on your mind, some issue that you've been writing or, or thinking about? Well, at some point in the past, I said that when... When, uh, you know, when my message goes mainstream, you know, grab the, the shotgun and, and the, the duffel bag of, of ammo and spam and head for the hills. And uh, I don't think my message will go mainstream because the mainstream is very much opposed to messages like mine. But circumventing mainstream media, which are no longer relevant in any case, in my opinion, um, I don't know too many people who even pay attention to it anymore. My message is definitely getting a lot more reach and getting louder. And I, I, I can tell from the, the, the number of subscribers I have and just the, the amount of reach that, that I'm having, um, not, not specifically in the US or even in the English wor English speaking world, but internationally, it's definitely getting out there. 
So as a predictor of how badly things are going, my popularity predicts that things are going pretty badly. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that with uh, even folks that I know in my circle who come from the more Western liberal perspective, as you, as you mentioned, the English speaking world, they're largely kind of clueless as to what's happening. The brainwashing has been, <laughs> indoctrination has been very, very good. Uh, and I'm noticing the people like the local people here in Kazakhstan and other places realize, uh, tend to realize, you know, what's, what's going on. Um, any final thoughts to leave us with uh, as we head into the second half of 2020? Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, this coronavirus is actually a big opportunity for a lot of people to discover that, uh, you know, the things that have, they've been deprived of, such as uh, direct human contact, are actually precious. And to um, kind of um, get out of this mode where every, everything is remote and everything is via the internet and actually start making contact with each other. And uh, the other thing that I want to uh, explain to people, if, if in case they haven't understood this, is, is that SARS-CoV-2 is not much of a, a threat. In fact, dying from it is, would be like winning the lottery, unless you happen to be uh, obese, old, and sick, in which case you will die of something but it probably won't be the coronavirus either, but it, you will definitely die of something. For most people, it's just nothing to worry about. And so don't worry about it. Get out there and mingle. All right. People can find all of your books and writing over at clubordlov.blogspot.com. Uh, any other website or project uh, to mention? Uh, no, I uh, publish uh, a lot of essays on, on pa Patreon and then also Subscribestar, uh, which I... Uh, started publishing on when Patreon started censoring people because a lot of my readers didn't like the fact that Patreon was censoring people, not because Patreon was censoring me. I just want to make that clear. All right. Uh, I urge listeners to go to uh, Club Orlov, uh, and I think I'm, I might start subscribing uh, as well. So, Dimitri, I, I think you're well positioned in Russia. We hope you continue to thrive there. Uh, and thanks again for coming on Geopolitics and Empire. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast and interview. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com and you can sign up for our mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter in case we experience censorship and deplatforming. You can help the Geopolitics and Empire podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our channels such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, Minds, and Steemit. You can also help us by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcast platforms such as iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, Spreaker, and so on. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via PayPal or Bitcoin or becoming a regular monthly supporter on our Patreon. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com. Thanks for listening.